Welcome back. So we're going to talk about kind of how this um, tourism with balloons, hot air ballooning, kind of starts. Um, but she, before she gets into that, before uh, Hazel Tucker gets into that, they talk about something about an over-embedded network. Again, that's this whole idea of limited good again, where people are so closely connected and they've got nothing better to do than be worried about what other people are doing. This leads to kind of, kind of some negative, um, negative effects, right? Again, it's that competition to remain equal. One example of competition to remain equal that I remember quite well is, so when I was an undergraduate, I was not a business major. Um, I was in arts and sciences. Um, but we had a business school at my university, but it was a separate matriculation and everything. Uh, I didn't really take business classes uh, for the most part. But over in the business school, they had a special curve with all the grades that the average was always a B minus. Now, if everybody did really well on a test, like let's say the average was 95 because it was an easy test. So let's say you've got 90, which is below the average of 95, then you might get like a C, not an A minus like you would at a normal school. And so the business school students at this particular university really struggled with each other trying to find all sorts of ways to hurt their classmates. I mean, I always felt like they spent more time trying to hurt each other than they did actually studying. So, you know, and sometimes the business school students would take classes with us, but they weren't graded on their curve. They just kind of, it was just kind of the, uh, they were graded on a regular university curve, not the special business school curve. And you know how it is in class, like, um, you know, you're taking notes and your neighbor will kind of look to see what you wrote down because maybe they didn't hear what the professor said. So you just shift your paper over so they can see and say, did you get it? Yeah, okay, great. So the business school students will look on your thing to see what you'd written down. But if you looked on them, you know, they would, they'd turn away because they wanted to make sure that you didn't have any special advantage um, over them. And I used to laugh. I said, you know, this is not a business. You know, sometimes they take like French language classes or German classes or every once in a while they take like a... Um, uh, an economics class with you or something and, and and so that was the way they were and it got so bad I remember um, so first the first thing they started doing is they would go out the emergency exit on the roof of the library and they would throw all the books off the roof and then they throw them like in the bushes and then they would leave the library and then they go down into the bushes and then they would pick up all the library books and steal them so nobody else could have them um, Oh, they would lie and all sorts of stuff like, oh, the answer is this when they knew that was the wrong answer, you know, just to try to hurt their colleagues. And so, you know, and because, you know, the way it is in undergrad, especially, um, you know, when you're taking the same classes, you know, kind of like a cohort fashion, this is when you have an over embedded network, right? And so this is the same thing that's going on here in Turkey. So hopefully that clarifies. So then they start out talking about on page 937, this whole um, uh, hot air ballooning thing. Um, there's evidently some really cool things to see when you get in a hot air balloon in this region of Turkey. And it says a northern European couple starts um, the first ballooning operation in the late 1990s. And it winds up being about 11 hot air balloon operators in 2009. Um, and it's estimated that they were employing more than 500 people directly, including the crew, the drivers, office staff, whatever. However, notice that they're all outsiders. They're not from that region of Turkey. So that's kind of interesting. So there's a lot of mistrust about these outsiders. Now you think about that. When you've got a village of 2,000 people and suddenly an employer comes in and they employ 500 people, I and mean, then you think about the taxes they're paying, all the great things um, that can go along with that. But they're not worried about that. They're worried that somebody else is getting rich and they're not. There's no idea that the economy of this village can grow and everybody would have more because of these tourism operators. And this is kind of the f uh, one of the flaws of the cluster theory. Now, the cluster theory is basically when you have a bunch of overlapping services um, with competitors and supplemental um, activities, and so that there's kind of more economic growth. Think of Silicon Valley. Let's say that you want to be an app developer in Silicon Valley. You can go to Silicon Valley, you can move in there, and you can start developing your apps. Now, there's going to be lots and lots of other people who are designing apps too. They are your competition. However, as a customer, if you want an app developer, you can go to Silicon Valley and you can pick from a variety of app developers and chances are they'll eventually pick you as long as you're pretty good, right? So yeah, maybe this time you lose some of the business because there's 50 app developers ready to go and you know you just didn't get picked. But you know next time you'll probably get picked because people are just customers are continuing to go to Silicon Valley looking for app developers. And you also know your app development firm is gonna have great accountants, great lawyers, all those great supplementary services to actually support you. Okay? 
versus if you went to, I don't know, Omaha, which is not really a, a technology hub. You might, you know, you might be the only app developer in some suburb of Omaha, but again, nobody goes to Omaha looking for app developers, so you would get less business, even though you'd have a monopoly, basically, and you wouldn't be able to find those supplementary services. Um, I encourage you to watch my video on clusters that I've got on this channel if you'd like to know more. Um, there's also some funny stories about uh, some fails uh, that I had in my PhD program um, when I was a kid. Um, well, when I was younger, that is. So definitely check that video out. I kind of laugh about um, clusters. Maybe I give a, I'll give a simpler example. So I grew up in San Diego, and um, there was an area called Santee. And we would go to Santee. It was a little bit far from where we lived. Santee is east of San Diego. We'd go a little bit farther uh, to Santee because there was like a whole lot of things that we needed. There was like six different grocery stores. There was like a couple of malls, um, all sorts of stuff that we needed. And yeah, the six different grocery stores were all competing with each other. But here's the thing. We would go to Santee and we'd buy like certain things. We'd always buy our meat at Costco. We'd buy vegetables at Food for Less. And you know, we'd probably wind up hitting all six of those groceries. So yeah, they were competing with each other, but they were getting at least our business a little bit of our business versus none of our business. We wouldn't have gone to six different areas of San Diego to go grocery shopping, but when it's all kind of clustered there in one area, we were able to actually do that. And again, that was the, that was the malls, the restaurants, so you could kind of spend a whole day in Santee and have a pretty good time. It was, it was worth the trip, and so everybody got a little bit of business. This is another example of the cluster effect. I hope it helps. Now here's the weird thing with these balloon operators. This is the anti-cluster effect because the the operators of these uh, bed and breakfasts, they assume that if people are on a limited budget, they're only going to be able to choose. They're going to either buy carpets or they're going to go ballooning. Now, the hotel owners, even if they didn't necessarily own a carpet shop, they knew they could get really good commissions from the different carpet sellers because it you know, describes like you know a couple of dozen carpet sellers within a close proximity to the hotel. So, what that means is that the carpet sellers are in pretty stiff competition to give commissions to the hotels, right? So the hotel owners know, okay, I'm going to tell people that ballooning is dangerous and it's not safe because I want them to spend what little money they have on carpet, uh, carpets and tourism trinkets instead. So people were actually, even though the hot air balloon operators were offering very generous commissions, at least at first the hotels were not sending people on balloon rides. Isn't that crazy? Because they figured they'd get more money on the commission. But you think about that. If a lot of people, if they're on vacation, they can buy a carpet and they can go on a balloon ride. So, you know, of course, as a hotel owner, you get a commission from the carpet dealer and you get a commission from the balloon owner. You get more money. But they didn't see it that way. They saw that it was, um, the balloons were a replacement instead of um, adding uh, an additional activity. They didn't see it as, wow, people will come, more people will come here if the balloon operator is successful and I can get more people booked in my hotel. They said, no, they're going to spend their money on ballooning and not on the carpets. Right? They didn't think that you know, if the balloon operators do well, that draws in more tourism, they benefit too. That was completely not uh, the way they saw things. So, and it's kind of interesting because carpets were not a particularly competitive product in this region because there's tourism trinkets and carpets you know, available all over Turkey, including in this region. Um, another thing that I thought was pretty um, interesting is there was a lot of competition about owning hotel guests. Like, this is my guest and I own that guest and I have a right to their commission. So if a tourist went to, like, I don't know, a bar or something and the bar owner says, hey, if you do ballooning, you tell them I sent you, or you buy some carpet and you tell them I sent you, you get a special deal. Therefore, the hotel owner wouldn't get that commission. So people would argue with each other. Again, it's that competition to remain equal. Yes, maybe you lose out on the commission, but again, if everybody in the village does well, then you will do well too. That train of thought never enters their mind. Those were their guests. And it's interesting, actually, the mayor of this city was so opposed to the tours, uh, to the balloons, he said that um, he put in some restrictions because the balloons caused noise nuisance, um, they gave off poisonous gases, they were killing villagers' crops, and they affected the fertility of young women in the area. So they were really opposed to these balloon operators. They wanted to focus on the businesses that were already there, the locally owned and operated businesses. Um, so I thought this was um, quite interesting. So the next thing 
that winds up happening is eventually um, they wind up working a little bit more with the hot air balloons. Um, but again, you still see, I mean, it, it talks a little bit about uh, neighbors selling their cave houses um, and moving to, to larger cities. You know, they sell their, their bed and breakfast and they move to larger cities. Um, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of these local entrepreneurs also, they describe, they retire from the hospitality business and they, and they return to farming. It does describe just a little bit of cooperation that eventually happens um, with the ballooning companies, but, you know, there's an interesting example. It says that some of the operators uh, of the bed and breakfasts will try to get their tourists in for just one night so that they can sell them straight to the balloon operators and get that commission and then try to get somebody in the next night so that they can get another commission. Um, so this caused uh, a few a few problems. So. so in our next video we're gonna introduce it, we'll talk about the conclusion, we'll wrap up, but I hope you've enjoyed this. As always, give me a thumbs up, that's a like. Give me a subscribe and comment down below. And let me ask you this uh, for my viewers, what do you think? Do you think this is silly what these Turkish entrepreneurs are doing or do you think they have a point? What would you do in their shoes? Let me know below.